Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming today. Uh, a belated Happy New Year uh, 2012. Um, welcome to all of you in person and to our online audience, both in uh, the US and especially in Ethiopia, uh, for joining us for our continuing series, A Changing Ethiopia, here at the US Institute of Peace. And as we might hear later from our speaker, a change in continuity as well in, uh, in Ethiopia. My name is Ali Virgi. I'm a senior advisor to the Africa program here. And uh, the US Institute of Peace, I should mention, is a national, nonpartisan, independent institute founded by the US Congress in 1984 and dedicated to the proposition that a world without violent conflict is possible, practical, and essential for US and global security. And we're delighted uh, to have with us uh, today um, the author of uh, Fresh Hot Off the Press's book uh, entitled uh, The Puzzle of Ethiopian Politics, uh, our speaker, Dr. Terence Lyons, uh, who is uh, associate professor of, well, many things <laughs> at the School of Conflict Analysis and Re Reconciliation at George Mason University, politics and history and development and so on. Um, and if I were to conventionally introduce you, that's how I would do it and say you're the author of numerous books and articles on Ethiopia and Eritrea and the Horn of Africa and beyond uh, as well, Liberia and Ghana and so on. Uh, but without making you feel too old, uh, Terence, I should also say for the benefit of our audience that this book is in some ways also a mirror of your professional uh, life over the last 30 years. Uh, since you were first in Ethiopia back in 1986 um, and uh, when the, the military regime, the Derg, was still very much uh, in power and have followed Ethiopia ever since. So this book is for uh, the benefit of our audience, also uh, something which is very much personally connected with your own uh, life and development um, over uh, the last uh, three decades. And if we're to believe all those statistics about Ethiopian demography than uh, longer than most Ethiopians have uh, been alive today, in fact. So, not to make you feel old, as I say, but just for the relevance of context. I was very young when I first met you. <laughs> so, if we can start perhaps, um, Terence, with the central theme of this book, uh, the title of this book, you, you've entitled it The Puzzle of Ethiopian Politics. What is for you, the puzzle of Ethiopian politics. I mean, you speak a lot about the contradictions and logics of how the state was ordered and organized, and we'll get to, to that, but can you, can you explain for us what you see as the central puzzle of Ethiopian politics? Thank you very much uh, for, for having me, and thanks all of you for coming and uh, starting your, your week talking about Ethiopia, which is about the best way you can start your week, in, in, in fact. And I also want to say one thing about the way that you introduced me, the 30-year the, the uh, story, because I say in the, in the, in the acknowledgments that I feel like I've been having a 30-year conversation about Ethiopia, and this is when I just decided it was finally time to write it down. And there are, I'm not going to name names, but there's a number of people in the audience who've been talking about Ethiopia with me for almost that amount of time. And so I thank all of you, my Ethiopian friends, who I hope are able at least some of them to watch it online because it is a reflection of all of those endless and to me endlessly interesting uh, conversations that uh, resulted in this book. The puzzle of Ethiopian politics is partly uh, how did the uh, a small Marxist insurgent group from the topmost corner of Ethiopia, one of the poorest corners of Ethiopia, transform into one of the strongest political parties in Africa and able to remain, remain uh, in power uh, as the EPRDF from 1991 until today. That's part of my continuity story. Um, and that, to me, is a, there's two sides to that puzzle. I suppose the first way I tried to answer, answer that puzzle was to look at the EPRDF as an authoritarian party. This is a party that won the war, that, that has a you know, hierarchy, discipline, uh, and in that way is an effective political party, as most victorious insurgent groups are, whether it's Uganda, Rwanda, uh, some other insurgent groups, let me leave it that way. Uh, um, but then the, the second part of the puzzle is how did this group from Tigray transform 
itself into the EPRDF, multi-ethnic coalition, bringing in people from all around the country who didn't have that experience of the struggle, mm -hmm. didn't have that process of the socialization, the ties from the hierarchical ties, the relationships between the insurgent movement and the people in the countryside. That was true for Tigray, but not at all true for uh, the Konso, not at all true for Mostaromo, not at all true for large parts of the Amhara region. And so it became a party of very contradictory uh, units. And so that to me is the puzzle, is how that contradiction uh, remained uh, in, in place uh, from 1991 until either recently or I, I would argue still. So this puzzle, um, which in what you've just described effectively begins in 1991, still has, of course, historical antecedents before that sure. that we'll talk about in a moment. But I just want to interrogate this idea of the puzzle a bit further. Does it mean that for the TPLF and the EPRDF, this transformation, as you say, from a very small corner of Ethiopia to uh, something much broader. Is, was that the only way it could have been done? Does a puzzle imply that logic of there's only one way it fits together? Uh, you know, I, I, I suppose you could entertain counterfactuals where it turned out differently, but I do think for the TPLF, the dilemma that the TPLF faced in 1991 or, or the late 80s as it was imagining, you know, 1989, as it saw that it was going to move from Michele down to Addis Ababa. I mean, that it was going to become a national, uh, try to govern this uh, very fractured and large uh, state, is that they needed to have local partners. They needed to have intermediaries. They needed to have people who, the Tigrayans couldn't rule in the south and in Oromia and even in the Amhara region in the same way that they could in Aksum and Adwa and in Tigray. So they had to come up with a solution to that. Now they chose, I suppose, the solution of ethno-federalism and building on these ethnic wings into a coalition, the EPRDF coalition. Um, and I, and I do think that that was at least a logic that was kind of baked into how the TPLF uh, thought. Mm. Uh, to go back to the old national question mm. in Ethiopia, the subject of endless uh, debates and conferences. Um, and the, the, the alternatives would have been difficult. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you describe in the book this is a dramatic change in the national narrative what the TPLF and the EPRDF brought to Ethiopian politics. And part of that drama, I think it's core to your argument, are the two, as you uh, contrast them, contradictory logics of how the state uh, was ordered and what was pursued. And on the one hand, you have this uh, centralization and top-down level and hierarchical structure. On the other hand, you have this ethnic federal um, and regional autonomy or ethnic autonomy. Right. Can, can, you, can you explain a bit more about why these logics, first of all, what are these logics? I mean, what, when you talk about a top-down hierarchical state, did the EPRDF do to affect that? And how did it then pursue ethnic federalism, which we hear a lot about and all Ethiopia conversations discuss, but how are these things pursued and then how are they in contradiction? Let me start by laying out, uh, you've already uh, given us a pretty good uh, in indication of how, I'm, uh, how I present these two logics in the book, but let me say a, a couple of more words, is that the, the logic of the victorious insurgents of, of top-down, uh, of uh, democratic uh, centralism, of uh, a, a group that had it, a, a history of administering liberated territory in Tigray, which is not the same as being a government. It's military, you know, military uh, uh, administration that came to power with uh, some degree of legitimacy because they won the war, because they had sacrificed so much. So that's one story and one logic and one explanation for why in a, a very powerful authoritarian regime would govern Ethiopia uh, as it has. Um, but then the second logic is that the TPLF was from a t very, very small group and to, and to come up with a solution to the, f the war to peace transition, they had to come up with a way to broaden uh, and, uh, their, uh, the, to become more inclusive, to bring in people who were Oromos and Sadama and, and uh, Amhara and, and uh, you know, uh, Garage and all the rest of the, the peoples of Ethiopia. So they had ethno-federalism, which in the beginning, uh, 
well, let me, let me tell the story in this way. So the EPRDF, the ruling party in Ethiopia, is a coalition of four parties. One represents the Tigray people, notionally, it's the Tigray People's Liberation Front, one the Amhara, one the Oromo, and one a agglomeration of groups that are called the Southern Ethiopian Peoples. Uh, uh, as, uh, and, and so when those started off, the TPLF was this battle-hardened party that had been, you know, been in the field a long, long time, built relationships with the countryside and so on. The SEPDM, which is the southern wing of the ruling party, didn't exist in that time. I mean, these things were just created after or just before the transition. The Oromo, people, the Oromo People's Democratic Organization, what, the ruling party wing, was originally created out of uh, prisoners of war that they had captured from the Derg's army because they said, we need somebody to be the Oromo wing of our new national front. Who can we get? Uh, where there was a, another Oromo insurgent movement, the Oromo Liberation Front, that had a different perspective uh, on, on politics. And so... And I'd, I'd just like to say, I'd come back to Oromo later as well in terms of where things are today, but I think the point also that you're making is simply that because the Oromo was so numerous and such an important for them to be absent from this EPRDF construction, that, that's why you needed to have some kind of affiliate... Exactly. Uh, the Oromo, the census is very uh, controversial, but they are uh, uh, the largest single ethnic group in Ethiopia, uh, and so you can't govern Ethiopia without partners who can be your uh, agents in the Oromo uh, region. So in the beginning, the TPLF, there was a strong center in very weak regions because the TPLF had come out of the war. The, the Saddam is a bit, uh, another story, but the, but the Silk Day and the, and the Hadiya and all these other groups in the south had just become part of the coalition. And so that the TPLF could keep a balance between the center and the regions. But fast forward 25 years, fast forward most people, most Ethiopians' lifetime, and what you then have are these regional parties, non-TPLF parties, have developed roots in the countryside, have developed patron-client networks, have developed, the became more like little states. Let me just give you an anecdote to illustrate that. In fact, this was one of the times when I really began to think this through. In, in 2011, I was in Bahadar, the capital of the Amhara state. And there's a couple of things to notice. First of all, when you went by the court, there was a long, long line of Amhara people, workers, peasants, a lot of women actually, who were trying to sort out uh, property deals, trying to work out you know, divorces, family law, and so on. The Ethiopian state, as it, as it connected to them, was the Amhara state. Addis Ababa was a million miles away. If you needed to deal with the state, you went to Bahadar and you lined up to the Amhara court, what I can't remember its full name. And then the second piece of that at that same trip is I had a chance to meet the gentleman, <laughs> gentleman uh, who was the head of the Bureau of Administration and Security, so the local security guy. And as we were, I was trying to understand the nature of the militias that were uh, under his uh, under his control or under his ministry or his bureau. And he said, yeah, I think I have about 100,000 people with, under arms who, who were report to me. It's basically an army. You're a regional state, and yet you have basically an army. You have your own courts, your own university, your own flag, your own football team, your own uh, uh, narrative as who you are as Amhara. Uh, that, is, that didn't exist in 1991. That took time to grow. They didn't have the wartime experience to build that, and so they built it between 1991 and uh, this, this today, or I'm saying it, it, at least back to, to 2011. So we'll come back to the, the present day or the more recent day in a moment, but I, I really want to, to get to part of what I found very interesting about even continuity uh, at the time of the TPLF or EPRDF coming into power in 1991. And you point to both continuity with the Derg um, and with um, Haile Selassie's regime, particularly on land. Um, can, you, can you explain why that's significant? And part of the reason I'm asking you that question is I think Today, when we talk about the transitions or the, this idea that there is a change, uh, there is, as you said, and as I said in the introduction as well, uh, a great deal of continuity and a great deal of things that maybe aren't changing as much as uh, might be suggested or thought. But I think to understand that or to see the parallels, it's useful to think about what happened there prior to even the 1991 coming to power of, uh, of the EPRDF. So can you, can you explain that a little bit? 
that, that's a great question that I've never been asked in a policy forum, so I'm very much appreciative of somebody finally asking about, about the history, because I do think it is so fundamental to understanding uh, contemporary politics in Ethiopia. The, the first thing to say is that authoritarian, top-down uh, systems of power did not come in with the TPLF. That goes yeah. way, way back. Ethiopia is a very hierarchical, patriarchal society in which the, you know, the Orthodox Church and Haile Selassie you know, reinforced all of these uh, mechanisms. And so in one sense, the TPLF uh, and the EPRDF are, are, are building on very strong historical traditions and political cultures and people's understanding of where power comes from and how does one respond uh, to power. Uh, with, in, in terms of the, uh, the DERG itself, the government that ruled up until 1991, um, th they did two important things that you, you can still see in terms of Ethiopia uh, today. One was the land reform. They nationalized all land. They completely ended, in large parts of the country, the semi-feudal, quasi-feudal system in which many people, particularly in the South, were basically the terms aren't exactly, but for the purposes of, of convenience, were basically serfs, uh, and there was a landowning class and a, a you know official church. All that got smashed by the military regime in a, by fiat from above. And the, and the EPRDF has not changed that. I mean, this is the core of a largely agrarian state, and the state owns the land. Uh, so it, 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 that keeping that precedent, uh, that, that, that transformation, meant that they already started off in a pretty powerful uh, place. The other thing, and this goes back to some of my very, my very first times in Ethiopia under the Derg, one of the things that was noticeable was that even in what to me as an outsider looked like kind of very r rough neighborhoods of, of, of what to me as an outsider looked like shacks, had numbers on the door. Somebody had written numbers on the doors all the way through, and these were the Kabelis. These were local units of government that were very, very powerful. The Kabelis continue to exist in Ethiopia of today and are still both the source of uh, government services, but also, and perhaps more importantly, at least for my story, uh, a source of, uh, of, of, of surveillance and control of the people in the countryside. And that was not an, an EPRDF invention. That was taking the innovation, uh, the system of control that the DERG had put in and using it to continue uh, to to, uh, to govern in that way. Let me use another uh, anecdote uh, to illustrate a third aspect, I think, of the history of the Ethiopian state. And that the Ethiopian, the Ethiopian state has always has been a strong state, a state, you know, the, the deep poverty and, and, and civil war, but also a very strong state in the sense of a civil service, a thing that was there. There's a story about how there used to be a big statue of Lenin right in front of the uh, ECA, just down from the Hilton Hotel. Uh, he was marching off, you know, seriously into the into the future. Although some people said he was marching off towards Boli Airport, uh, which may have also been true. Um, but in that kind of iconic moment that you saw in a lot of 1989 and in, you know Eastern Europe, the statue came down. You know, but this was not a spontaneous mob of Ethiopians that did this. This was the Ethiopian Highway Administration. And one of the reporters asked the guy who was controlling the heavy machinery, uh, you know, what does it mean to him taking it down? He said, well, they told me to put it up 10 years ago. They told me to take it down now. I, you know, that's the state. I show up and I do what the state tells me to do. And that didn't go away. The collapse of the Mengistu regime or the collapse of Haile Selassie didn't mean that people didn't show up at work, collect their paycheck, do what they were you know, supposed to do, in contrast to some other uh, parts of Africa. So that there's a continuity of a strong state that the EPRDF has uh, further strengthened, but that predates uh, 1991. But do you see that continuity as being uh, different in different places? I mean, this is a story of Addis, right? I mean, the, it is a story of where the central state Indeed. has been and, of course, where the empire, at least the latter part of the empire, was centered, where the, the Derg was centered. The experience, perhaps, elsewhere was different. Is that also part of the story, that there are, in some ways, contradictory logics or different logics depending on which part of Ethiopia or which region you're looking at? Absolutely. Uh, and the... Uh, um, I'm trying to see just how much I can do this uh, do this quickly, but if the first cut, if all you wanted to do was to understand Ethiopia, to see it as a difference between the northern highlands, which tend to be agriculturalist and tend to be Christians, and southern lowlands, which are usually uh, not 
Amhara speaking, at least initially, and are often more pastoralist and more Muslim, although more complicated than that as well. And so for the people of the North, the state was something that they recognized. The state was something that gave them some measure of protection. The state was something that had a narrative that included them. Uh, where in, where, but in the South, what the state was, was something that taxed them, something that sent soldiers to seize their crops, something that said being uh, in a Romo or a, uh, a Konso or, or uh, Somali, Afar, was not to be really Ethiopian. You really needed to be Amhara. Uh, to be properly Ethiopian. Now, the Amhara category was flexible enough that people could become Amhara, could be Amharaized. Many Oromos went and you know, they joined the military, they worked their way up through the bureaucracy, they went to the university, they began to dress like an Amhara, they began to speak Amharic, often they became Orthodox Christians, but they always had a different relationship to the state, that, that uh, the, um, the Oromo and the other southern uh, peoples relationship to the state is very, very different than the relationships that many in the North had. Uh, but as you've described, the policy that the EPRDF and took to this issue of identity in Ethiopia was also a very different one. Um, so yes, of course, you had that centralizing tendency, but you also had this very uh, different model, um, in Ethiopia at least, of what became known as ethnic federalism or ethno-federalism. And so in terms of how that actually then structured uh, the state, and you, you pointed out that in the beginning in 91, uh, the affiliate parties of the EPRDF other than the TPLF were much, much weaker. Um, so today or 25 years on, they were much stronger or at least differently, mm -hmm. co differently con constituted in terms of no longer being just mere fronts, let's say, even if there was also much weakness within them. So this, this idea of ethnic federalism and how it's been structured and played out over the last 25 years, I mean, part of this brings us back to the, the original question of the puzzle, right? That out of this, you said that part of what was needed for the TPLF was to build legitimacy and to offer something to other regions. And part of the way it did that was through this mm -hmm. approach. Was that successful? I mean, if you were to evaluate how well that achieved their goals, do you think it did so? Did it provide enough of a logic uh, for the state over the last 25 years, or at least until 2011, if we, if we stop there for a moment? Uh, in, in terms of, uh, you know, did it work, th there were an awful lot of people, myself included, in the mid-1990s that worried that this wasn't going to work, you know, that this was a mistake from the, from the get-go, it was going to undermine, undermine national unity, uh, it was really TPLF under, uh, uh, you know, with these, with these, with these uh, uh, faults. So success to the extent that here they are, you know, 25 years later, uh, even more than almost 30 years later, and here they are. Uh, so in that way, a success in terms of an authoritarian resiliency, an authoritarian way to remain in power when, through a lot of crises, splits within the TPLF, war with Eritrea, all kinds of humanitarian emergencies, a real uh, political crisis after 2005 elections and so on, it, 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 kept, it, it kept coming back. But I do think that um, well, Nikte, but how did this, this ethno-federalism, how did the people in Ethiopia uh, respond to that? In my view, and I might be challenged by others who were on the ground when I wasn't, uh, in much of southern Ethiopia, what's called the SNNPR, Southern Nations, Nationalities, and Peoples Region, there were people who felt alienated from the state who all of a sudden had their own zone, if not region. All of a sudden could use their own language in schools and in courts. All of a sudden their high school graduates were able to get positions in the bureaucracy that they never could before. And so for many people in the South, ethno-federalism meant that finally they could have they, they, could, they, could, they could behave in this way. They could become part of the state um, in ways that they hadn't before. Uh, in the Oromo region, the, the largest region, it was further complicated because there's a very deep Oromo narrative of resistance to the Ethiopian state. Resistance not through the uh, wing of the EPRDF, but through the Oromo Liberation Front, which had fought 
continuously and had in its heart, many Ethiopians, many Oromos, in their heart saw the OLF as the uh, representative of, of the nation. And so that ethno-federalism meant something different. And mm -hmm. it was half, it was partly what they aspired to, autonomy, self-determination, but it was also seen as autonomy under the same northern uh, you know, occupation right. that they'd seen before. Uh, you know, Amhara, Tigray, it doesn't really matter. We, Oromo, still don't have our fair, our fair shot. And then in the Amhara region, a much more complicated relationship to ethno-federalism, because I, I alluded to this briefly, the Amhara as an identity category is overlaps with Ethiopia yeah. as an identity category. And so it was hard for the Amhara regional uh, officials to, to separate that. The Amhara opposition party similarly had a, had a problem. Are we the all Amhara people's organization or are we the all Ethiopian unity yeah. uh, party? And lots of very difficult to work that out. It's an interesting story when we get up to 2018 and 2019. But the, um, so ethno-federalism, as you sort of, you set up my prior question, ethno-federalism had different meanings for different places. Yeah. Um, so I guess that's... Yeah, I mean, you've got a, you've got a quote, a good quote from, from Mellis, which I think is in, insightful on this subject in the book. And he was he often said, insightful. Yeah, that, uh, you know, we tried a, a feudal monarchy and a repressive dictator couldn't hold Ethiopia together, and now we're trying another way. And that implies, at least to me, a, a degree of, experimentism, you know, that there is, we're trying another way, maybe we'll, we'll see what happens. Obviously he believed in it and has, you know, argued that very forcefully. But as you just said, if you are an Amhara, then you wouldn't necessarily see the historic Ethiopian state as not holding Ethiopia together, right? Indeed. You would say that it had. If you were from a Tigray, you would see it very differently. So to some extent though, this is a question of how mutable this ethnic identity is, if you can be absorbed into the center or not. So wh why do you think uh, it really became um, such a fervent project for the EPRDF and the TPLF? Was it simply, you know, as you said, they're, they're searching for a logic where they needed to uh, gain that legitimacy and this is something that could be extended to the regions? Obviously there was an ideological fervor amongst at least some of the uh, the members uh, of the of the core party. I mean, it it, it does seem like um, an experiment, if if you use that term, which would be very difficult to control. I mean, maybe not for um, years to come, but it, it would seem like you know where where does it end? And especially, I think you you describe the the original definition of ethnicity. Um, that the EPRDF used as a, as a very primordial one, a very you know, essentialist, basic one. So given what you know about the thinking of the party at the time and its, its uh, intellectual leadership and so on, I mean, was it more than an experiment? I mean, did they see that there could be different manifestations of it? I mean, it's obviously difficult to, to fully address what they foresaw, but I'm just curious how you given the legacy of how the Ethiopian state had been structured for centuries uh, before, this dramatic change is more than just dramatic. It's, it's such a fundamental reordering of the, the way the state had been constituted. Uh, the, uh, the, the experiment comes out of a couple of different uh, Strains. There is an ideological strain. The student movement had long debates about what they called then the national question and how the revolution was going to play out, often debates that seem quite obscure today, but you know, people were killing each other yeah. over these debates in the, in the mid-1970s. Uh, and so the thinking of Melisanawi and the people around him about the national question was very deeply grounded. And so they were, I think, ideologically committed to this. On top of that, as I said before, I think it has this, lo this governing logic that helped solve some of the fundamental challenges that the uh, EPRDF faced in 1991. Now, how has it lasted so long uh, when it is a, uh, you know, maybe not the most obvious way to structure a state as complicated as Ethiopia? What I would say is that it, um, 
it, in part that, 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 that's uh, solved or answered by, they created political facts on the ground that created political institutions and political interests to perpetuate the system that was first put down there. Let me mention a couple. The first thing they did is they created a new map of Ethiopia. They created new regions. They got rid of the old regions and they created new ones. So there was a region of Oromia, where the Oromo used to live in, I don't know, it's in the book, but six, seven, eight different, different regional states. They created a Tigray, which did have its own history, actually, but an Amhara region where many of the people didn't see themselves as Amhara. It's they southern. created a southern region where most people had no, they didn't have a southern identity. Their identities were much more localized and much more parochial. But then, you know, as the years go by and political parties begin to mobilize, they mobilize on those boundaries. If you're an Oromo politician, you don't, can, don't campaign in the Amhara region or in the Garage region or in the, you know, any of the other regions mm -hmm. because that is the political world that this system has created for you. If you're an ambitious bureaucrat and you start off in the Wurrida, which is lower than the regional state, you start off as a Wurrida uh, dealing with agriculture, your aspiration is often to get to Bahadar yeah. or to Hawassa. It, it's, it's your, 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 your bureaucratic life uh, is very linked to the regional state that you're in. And so there, therefore the elite has interest in keeping this going. To go back, let's just say imaginary, to the map before uh, the 1980s map would mean that a whole class of politically powerful, bureaucratically high level people would have their jobs at, at risk right then. Uh, and so you create these facts on the ground that then perpetuate themselves. I, I, I say in the book, they had, uh, Ethiopia had local elections in 1992 within a year of taking over power that I had the uh, ability, a privilege of, of observing. Um, and after that, because that election really early on set in place that ethnic map, set in place those ethnic parties, and those facts on the ground then continue to this day that once those are put in place, it's very, very difficult mm -hmm. to change them. I mean, one other thing, maybe going to get you more, more uh, contemporary than you want to it right now, but um, uh, the, one of the problems of that, we talked about the primordial nature of identity, but it also ties people to their place. If you were in Oromo, you should be living in Oromia, but this is a country that's rapidly urbanizing. This is a country that is building up an industrial base. This is a country where people are getting better educated. They have increased access to social media. And so to say you were born in Oromia, you are a Romo, you will vote for the Oromo party, you know, isn't the way people are living their lives anymore. They often are trying to get a job someplace else. They're often moving for school or, or marrying somebody who's uh, used to be on their identity card, listed a different uh, ethnicity on their identity card. I mean, I was going to ask you about the, the 92 elections that you, for that reason, the, the, for centralizing and sort of um, consolidating this, this model. Uh, of course, those elections were followed by votes in 95, 2000, 2005, 2010, 2015. With the exception of 2005, I mean, as you also point out in the book, given the, the way, for example, that the parliamentary constituencies are structured, that to win um, a majority in the parliament um, out of the 547 seats, which are all ethnically constituted seats, you need to also play that ethnic game, right? I mean, it's... Uh, it's uh, the facts on the ground, or I think is also, as uh, Lovies Allen has called it, the <laughs> ethnic entrepreneurship, you know, that people have, have used this. And in some ways, that's what you're saying with the, the parties, that they've, they've also evolved uh, and, and, and done that. Um, I suppose the question then becomes, why was 2005 these elections where there was contestation, there was violence, there was uh, a degree of openness. It's still, um, according to various people, unclear what exactly happened in terms of the results. The observers were uh, very concerned about what occurred. Why was that election different, one? And what is the legacy of that for today? I mean, the 95, 2000, every other election has basically been pretty uncompetitive. Yes. Um, there is one exception there. There's a lot of talk about coming elections. We'll get to that a bit later, I think. But just for the purposes of, of setting the stage, why was that one different? I say one thing about the other, the other elections, because yeah. uh, I, I think it helps us understand better 
both 2005 and what might happen in, in 2020, is that they were non-competitive, but they were very important for the EPRDF. Right. They were important for the EPRDF, both as demonstrations of their power, as a way to sort out who was going to get promoted, who was going to be sidelined, who you're going to bring into the center, who you're going to, you know, we know this guy's not man or woman is not uh, is, is either corrupt or a bad administrator. We're not going to let him or her come to the center and be an MP as she or he wishes. And this is the way that we as a party are going to sort out some party business. Um, and uh, so the 100% uh, 2015 election, for example, was not about selecting the next government. That was never on the table, but it was a way for the EPRDF to say, don't you even think about challenging us. There is no other way but our way. Uh, and we have complete control, and that was important for the EPRDF. 2005 was different. I'll give a bit of the narrative, and then my not maybe quite satisfactory answer as to why I think it happened. Um, in 2005, there was an opportunity for the opposition to mobilize. They very quickly mobilized two opposition coalitions that didn't really exist in January 2005, competed in most of the major populated areas, uh, campaigned widely, uh, had access to the media, televised debates, mass uh, dem uh, you know, uh, speeches. They had a huge uh, rally, rather, in, uh, in Mescala Square in you know, very dramatic uh, fashion. Uh, and by the official vote counts, they won something like 30% of the seats. The opposition disputes these results. But even just by that measure, it was extraordinarily different narrative about politics in Ethiopia after that election than before that election. 30% of a parties that didn't even exist hardly, you know, six months before, beat what I have described as this incredibly powerful authoritarian government, the incumbent who controlled all of the regional governments, controlled all the Kabelis, and so on. It really was quite a, quite a, a, a shock uh, to, the, uh, to the system. And then there was a crackdown, and we can talk about that uh, as well. But the first question is, well, why on earth would the EPRDF do that? Why would they allow such, a, uh, such an election? And my first answer is, it's still something of a puzzle to me. I should have said the puzzles uh, rather than uh, 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 the, uh, the puzzle. There's a couple of different partial things that, that, people, that people point to. One is the pressure from the international community to have, uh, you know, free and fair elections or competitive elections. Many people tell the story and they say, well, you know, the international community put pressure on the EPRDF to hold elections, and so they held elections in order to please the international community. I'm not really persuaded by that. I'm not sure the international community cares all that much, frankly, as we saw in 2010 and 2015 and 2000. The international community has other interests that Trump interest in, uh, Trump interest in uh, democracy and elections uh, in Ethiopia. The other way of thinking about it is to go back into the history of the party. The, the TPLF, this core of the party, split in 2001, a really serious split. I think the Central Committee split like 12 against 11 or yeah. 13 against 14. It was really right down the middle, a very, a very near thing. Uh, and so this was the first election after that. And so this was an election that perhaps the leadership said, look, if we have a, a more competitive election that will help us get past that uh, you know, existential threat that we went through in 2001 and be able to say that, look, we were competitive. That, I think, probably has some merit. The third thing I would point to is uh, I think the EPRDF was honestly surprised. I was honestly surprised. If you ever ask me to make predictions, ask me what I predicted in 2005. <laughs> um, because Ethiopia is an extraordinarily rural state, 85% at that time rural. And I think the conventional wisdom, I think this is what I thought, is that, well, okay, the opposition is going to do well in Addis and maybe in Bahadar or Deir Dawa, a couple of other cities. But in the countryside, it's still sewn up. The, the EPRDF still has its machinery, its cadres, its resources in the countryside in ways that nobody else even comes close to. Uh, and if you think, as I normally do, that strong political parties typically win elections, then uh, the EPRDF had reasons to expect that, it, that this election would not threaten it in the way that it did. Um, so I guess that's my, my answer. So, I mean, how do you explain then, uh, we have, as you said, a very strong party, which has demonstrated fragility, right, both in 2005, more recently, and yet, as you pointed out, this is a party that originated with a very 
cohesive organizational structure with this shared legacy of uh, fighting the conflict, um, of everything it had uh, achieved over uh, the preceding years to both consolidate its power, uh, its control of the state, and so on. W what explains that fragility then? I mean, what, what is it simply the rebalancing, as you say, of the other constituent members of the coalition of the EPRDF that they got stronger and therefore even if the, the the lead party was still quite strong it was not as much the gap was not as significant uh, between its strength and uh, the, the next two three four in the in the in the coalition or do you see other explanations for why despite all of these advantages of incumbency of resources etc uh, the party has demonstrated that it is fundamentally fragile? Uh, I think that the, the, the party recognized its fragility in 2005. Mm. And the aftermath of 2005 demonstrates what they thought they needed to do yeah. uh, in order to overcome that fragility. I think in 2005, again, it's in the book, they had something like 700,000 party members. Yeah. They very quickly moved up to 8 million members. So they went on a massive recruitment. This is the EPRDF as a this whole. This is the EPRDF as a whole. They went on a massive recruitment. They realized that they did not have the control of the countryside that they thought. Uh, they needed to recruit people. Uh, they made the links between the party and the state much closer, and so you needed to be uh, on the good, on the right side of the party in order to get access to fertilizer and get your kids into higher education and all kinds of other things, you know. And so in that way, they they strengthened the party in response to 2005. Mm -hmm. uh, I, so in my best explanation, and I'm not, as I say, I. I I'm not sure I fully get this, the, the, this, I get the question, but I don't get the answer to it, is that they, they thought they were stronger than they were. Mm. The, the, they thought that they were not going to be challenged in the way that they were because afterwards they immediately changed very significant things and made themselves, they were not going to have that problem again in 2010. They were not going to have that problem again in 2015. Uh, and, they, and they shattered civil society and they kept the opposition in court and in jail and forced them abroad and so on and so forth, made it much, much, made it virtually impossible for 2005 to be repeated. Right. But then what explains the fragility of the party more recently than, than 2005, 2016? As you said, just pointed out, elections were also held in 2015, uh, basically another 100% election or 100% minus one seat, I think it was. So what then explains how, again, the party became or demonstrated that it was uh, so fragile. I mean, what, what are your explanations for that? First, I have to uh, uh, make fun of this guy Lyons who wrote in 2016, uh, writing about the 100% elections, along with my friend Leonardo Areola. Uh, elections in 2015 confirm that authoritarian rule will persist in Africa's second most populous country for the foreseeable future. And then a year after that, it all began to fall apart. So it depends how far you can foresee, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's right, foreseeable. I, yeah. you should, I, I, you know, I don't see that well in the, into the distance. And, 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 and so, uh, uh, so in 2016, a range of demonstrations uh, broke out. There have been demonstrations regularly. The Ethiopian Muslims demonstrated. There were demonstrations in response to what was called the Addis Ababa Master Plan, which many Oromo saw as threatening uh, their interests. But in 2016, it was different. It was much more widespread. It was very, very young demonstrators. They were often in small towns that I didn't know existed. I mean, they, I would read in the, in the media, you know, uh, whatever, 150 people killed in such and such a town in Oromia. I mean, what the heck is that? Let me Google that. I don't even know where it is. Well, I've been working on Ethiopia for 30 years. So these were really not in the university towns, which had been the past pattern, but lots of small little market crossroad uh, kinds of towns. The, the Ethiopian government responded as it usually did. It said these were uh, either uh, narrow nationalists or working for the Eritreans or misguided, arrested large numbers of them, used the security services to clear the streets, and then they came back again. It did not work as it had in prior rounds of protest, and it spread further. Um, at that moment, now, so the, let me park that explanation for a minute. 
at, the, at, a, at a similar time, but for different reasons, there was a crisis within the EPRDF. Part of it is the story that you've, you've related or, or, or recalled that the OPDO and the ANDM, the, the non-TPLF parts of the ruling party, were, were getting more self-confident. They began to increasingly say, hey, we are not just the step the, 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 the little brother of the TPLF. We're bigger than them. We have different interests than them. We're going to step up on our own. Uh, the Oromo protest allowed particularly the Oromo wing of the ruling party to position itself to straddle with one foot uh, being responsive to the anger on the Oromo street, if you, if you will, uh, and another firmly within the party. Uh, and a kind of a hybrid populism incumbent, which is a strange kind of positioning, but it was about that the old order has done you wrong and therefore you should support me. And so this group of Oromo reformists uh, began to, uh, to gain power. The, the, the EPRDF really was in a crisis, couldn't end the protests, had two states of emergency, de facto martial law, uh, and, but, but uh, something had to be done. The, the Prime Minister uh, Haile Mariam, uh, uh, resigned, and there was a gap. There really was an interregnum of which it looked very, very worrisome. I mean, looking at Ethiopia in uh, January, February 2018 looked very, very serious that this was a government that couldn't uh, sort itself out. And so the, the, it's, a, it's, a, it's a combination, it's a, again a dual crisis, both on the streets, which is largely the political economy crisis. People didn't have jobs, young people were, uh, you know, felt they deserved better than they could see in their foreseeable futures. Uh, and within the party that the old model of a strong center could not be recreated and yeah. therefore some other way of trying to govern uh, was necessary. Some other way for the party to change so that it could uh, continue to govern. I mean, isn't there a, a, an additional explanation as well, which you do point to in, in your book about the, legit the, sorry, the legitimacy of the of the TPLF and what you know coming out of this this armed struggle and you, you make the point that 30 years after it had happened you know that memory is fading uh, what does it mean if you weren't in a conflict affected uh, area to begin with uh, you know that the knowledge of the sacrifices that were made is is different so I mean I guess that's obviously true right things fade with time but why after 30 years and not after 25 or 20 I mean why even 2005 uh, for a good number of people, I'm sure uh, it was, uh, especially young people, not something that they had directly experienced or only for a brief period of time. So wh where does this question of diminishing legitimacy also fit into this? Uh, yeah, so you, the, the, the story of uh, you know, 1991 was a long time ago. Uh, and uh, not only do sort of rank and file Ethiopians no longer remember it, the, uh, the ANDM, for example, the Amhara wing of the party, began to retell the story of their origins, began to talk about not how they, uh, you know, under the TPLF's leadership uh, became part of the EPRDF, but hey, we struggled too. We, we have a history that's not a TPLF history and began to emphasize that, particularly on the anniversaries of the founding of the ANDM. It was an ANDM story, the Amhara uh, party uh, 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 story. Um, the, uh, so that's part of it. There's, a, there's, a, there's a, another explanation that goes in a different direction, and that is uh, it became perceived, I'll say, widely. Uh, almost all non-Tigrayan Ethiopians are convinced, and for some good reasons, that the TPLF is, is corrupt that the advantages of the developmental state of 10% growth GDP for years and years of all of this massive development that made Ethiopia rising, this kind of narrative, that they say, I don't see that in my town. Mm -hmm. That must have all gone up to Tigray. So there was a perception that not only did they not have the legitimacy from having won the war, mm -hmm. what have you done for me lately, yeah. but also that we are further being sort of a relative deprivation story. Mm -hmm. It's even worse because those guys are stealing what is legitimately mine. Mm -hmm. And this came up particularly on questions of land leases, for example. As development began in, to go into the Oromo region, for example, uh, Oromo farmers would be compelled to give their land to investors who were going to set up floor culture or all kinds of other things, roads and schools and all kinds of other things. And they'd be paid, you know, a thousand burr and the land would be leased out for a hundred thousand burr. And not surprisingly, the farmers said, 
that doesn't yeah. seem fair. Yeah. Um, and uh, enlarge uh, agro-industrial uh, interests that uh, were part of the development plan, part of why Ethiopia had this story of Ethiopia rising. But if you look down like in the South Omo, where the sugar plantations were, just huge numbers of people were displaced, uh, traditional you know, dry land pastures were seized, the ability to do, you know, what do you call it, flood? You, uh, after the floods, you plant along yeah. the river, uh, river banks. Uh, the, you know, the livelihoods in the South Omo were really shattered in order to allow commercial sugar. Yeah without any compensation, without even any, any uh, you know, real uh, compensation. And so people were, the, the very development that, the good news was the EPRDF was able to have this development story, and it's real, I mean, there's roads, there's regional universities, there's health clinics, but at the same time, that very success led to a kind of a relative deprivation story of, but the Tigray got twice as much as we get. Uh, and, and, and that way it built up grievances rather than, uh, uh, you know, providing the services did not provide legitimacy as the EPRDF thought. And these are, I think I would probably think it was more that, yeah, they gave us a university, but they have a better one. They're getting more money. Their hospital is better than our hospital. They're getting rich. You go into Addis and there's big glass office buildings that are the EPRDF or TPLF owned endowment fund has mm -hmm. built up banks and insurance companies and hotels and so on. And people ask, where'd that money come from? It won't get into that, the longer story. There's a METEC as well. METEC right. was this uh, military, military yeah. engineering technology that was in deeply involved in the sugar and also in the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. And as we now, at least as alleged now in court, huge amount of money was disappearing uh, into that. But I, I think the, the, in the bigger picture, the, what you've described is in some sense, you could add it as another contradiction to this explanation of the state that on the one hand you have constitutionally, legally, this federal autonomy at a certain level, but when it comes to the fiscal dimension, the economic dimension, uh, what you've just described in terms yeah. of investment and distribution and, and who gets what, a, a very different kind of model. I mean, the developmental state, which you also talk about in the book, in some sense, requires a degree of centralization and central control. Uh, so how does that reconcile with this move towards group rights and group identities and, you know, what you've offered as the explanation for how uh, the EPRDF was able to maintain control or consolidate its control? The, um, I think what you saw was that the, the uh, so there's again sort of four different economic stories, yeah. I could say, and that again leads to this, my, my let me take one step further back. Um, what a lot of people who've heard me present bits of this or read earlier things that I've written say, no, Lyons, you misunderstand it. The EPRDF is just the TPLF, mm -hmm. full stop. That's all there is. Or furthermore, people will say, it was all Mellis. It was a personal rule. It was just him. He died. That's the EPRDF it. doesn't matter. It's, it, and I, was, I would argue, I think it does matter. It has 8 million members. It has you know, offices in every small town. It has uh, these incredible endowment funds that controlled an awful lot of, the, of, the, uh, of business in Ethiopia. Five to one. Yeah. Five to one. I mean, really controlled yeah. down to the lowest level. There were, every five people had one person who was uh, the uh, EPRDF minder. Uh, there's probably a better homework word for it that somebody would tell me. Um, so what the OPDO, for example, was doing was what the OPDO, the reformist leadership of the OPDO said, we should have what Tigray has in our state. Mm -hmm. So we need to find a way to get those investments. We need to find a way so that we, the OPDO, become the partners of, uh, of, of international investment, become the owners of, uh, you know, of uh, investments, of, of manufacturing, and so on and so forth. So it wasn't a... Uh, it, was, it was trying to catch up with the TPLF it, rather than uh, moving in a different direction. So you see, for example, some of the, uh, the struggles in uh, uh, Hawassa and the Sadama area of the southern region is because of a large industrial zone, an industrial park that was put down there. Who's going to control it? Who's going to control the dams? Who's going to control the sugar? Who's going to control uh, these, these, these different things? Mm. Um, and so the party elites uh, the Southern parties, the Amhara parties, were involved in an awful lot of this economic, mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, economic uh, business. They were usually the local partners, uh, but 
uh, as I said before, the perception, and I think for reasons, they were, this perception was there for a reason, uh, people regarded uh, the TPLF as overwhelmingly uh, getting uh, more than its fair share. Uh, this story has popped in my head twice, so I might as well tell it. I was talking with somebody who's actually a diaspora guy uh, who was very, very articulating the idea. It's all going to the TPLF. It's all going to Tigray. It's all going to Tigray. And this was early on in the 90s. And I said, well, but you know, Tigray is actually really poor. It was really destroyed by the war. And so, you know, and he said, oh, you, they have this, this, this airport there. It's, it's they got a brand new airport. And I said, well, I was there like a month ago. And it's a dirt strip. He said, ah, they put dirt on it so you couldn't see it. <laughs> mm -hmm. that's, how they're, that's how tricky they are. <laughs> like, really? You know, so you get these yeah. kinds of stories that the TPLF was everywhere. Uh, when in fact there were always plenty of OPDO and ANDM and other uh, groups that were involved in this developmental state business, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of it with, with big money being distributed on the basis of a political logic, mm -hmm. you put it that way. So in, in, in that sense, there was a limit to how decentralized or how much autonomy there is uh, at a regional level or perhaps more accurately at a sub-regional whether we talk about the, the Warda or the zone or the yep. Kabele, yep. um, would that be a fair way to think about it? Because part of the challenge, I think, is you still have this idea and argument that you know a decentralized model or an ethnically federal model makes sense for Ethiopia, or people who say, well, it's there now and it's been built on, and so you know, as much as you might say it's got its flaws and its difficulties, it's here to stay. Uh, but when it comes to the economic dimension or the, the, the way the state is, is structured in terms of its participation in the economy, um, it doesn't seem to have been quite as extensive in terms of allowing that level of um, freedom for uh, the states or the sub-state levels to have uh, the ability to, to also be, uh, if not economically self-sufficient, then at least largely self-sufficient. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great point, because another part of the center versus periphery, the, the hierarchical center and then the autonomous uh, periphery contradiction was economically, that the center controlled the wealth, they controlled the money that then was sent out to the regions to do uh, to pay for civil servants and for and for other things and so it was very much uh, how did the center manage to balance the regions was in part because they were the ones writing the checks right. the cent the regions had the ability to tax but there was nothing really to tax a huge percentage of the money came in a direct uh, you know a, a transfer uh, from uh, the federal uh, government it's changed a little bit but it's still largely uh, largely the same. And so, in the developmental state had this, this centralizing logic. So even as the EPRDF as a party began to be more decentralized in terms of fiscal centralization uh, and in terms of the developmental state deciding that the dam is going to go here and the road is going to go there and we're going to fix this railroad before we give you a road, that was still all done very, very centralized. Mm. Um, I mean, this kind of brings us to the, the present day or close to the present day. Um, and as we were talking before uh, we started, you, you said that, you know, the original idea for the, for the book was to end with the state of emergency that was imposed um, after the, the protests began a couple of years ago. Obviously, um, there's been more to it since then. And without um, giving too many spoilers to the audience, uh, we do carry on past the state of emergency and uh, not quite to the present day, but certainly uh, to, let's say, the contemporary period after uh, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed became um, leader of Ethiopia and um, the initial period of his premiership, let's say. Um, and, you know, to be fair, of course, nobody can, uh, can predict exactly what will happen. But what I wanted to ask you was if we, if we start with that sort of period um, after the protests began um, and contrast that with what you said about, you know, this idea you have these young people coming in who either don't have jobs or don't have sufficient jobs or they may have some opportunity but it doesn't match what their university education has mm -hmm. offered them or as the examples you've just given you know well we've got something but Tigray has got something better and whether that's true or not that that perception existing in, in some quarters you have that logic and that sort of demand and we see that today whether it's uh, in uh, Sidama or South Omo in the southern region where uh, people have this idea well if we're a state uh, and not just a, a warrior or a zone then we can somehow be 
you know, more empowered or have more um, access to political power, economic power, um, more recognition. You have these sorts of narratives and logics going on where uh, this is an unfolding of the constitution arrangements that have been put in place since uh, 1995 or since the uh, EPRDF has been in power. On the other hand, and you point this out as well, you have Api Ahmed making claims to something which is uh, more of a pan-Ethiopian concept as well, and certainly he's done that when he's uh, come here. You mentioned his uh, his address in, in Washington um, last year, I guess it was, 2018. Um, Jubilation. How do you reconcile that? I mean, on the one hand, you're arguing, and you argue that, and, and we'll come to this in, in more detail in a moment, that there is continuity with the present leadership given the EPRDF legacy um, that has come before it and they, that they are operating within the same framework. On the other hand, you have Abi Ahmed, as I just said, you know, calling to this pan-national identity, at least in some cases. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You have other Ethiopians trying to exercise their constitutional rights. I mean, how does this fit together today in terms of the logic of the state? Uh, well, I, I, I'm going to write a book on that. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, the, um, well, let me get to start the, the sort of the continuity of the EPRDF piece, and then I'll try to do some of the more uh, developments over the last uh, uh, 18 months or so. Is that, I, I mean, I did a slide for a presentation in 2015, which I talked about the EPRDF, 8 million members, control of the endowment funds, 100% in the regional and national parliament, 100% of the judges. I mean, it's an incredibly centralized thing. And then I was going to do an updated slide to describe the EPRDF uh, and, you know, post Abbey, right. and it's still got six million members. It still controls every state and parliament and in the regions. It still controls and controls and controls. And so, there's an, so on a structural level, there's an awful lot of continuity. Now, Abbey is not Melissanawi by a long shot, and the symbolism, the political narrative around uh, Inoromo being head of state. He's younger. He's um, and that the, the um, Ethiopians uh, make this claim, but I've heard it said that he's charismatic in a way. Uh, he's certainly a media savvy TV mm -hmm. kind of guy where Melis would yell at you and right. he he's, talks about love. And he's from the social media era. He's I mean, a social Mel Melis wasn't. Right. He's a, he, he, he knows how to tweet or his, uh, his, his folks do. Um, uh, and so in that way, very different. Yeah. He has... Uh, made uh, overtures, I mean, mm -hmm. his, his official philosophy is this idea of metamer, which is sort of like addition, adding on, we're all together without losing our own individual uh, pieces. So I mean, maybe you would say like a mosaic or something like that. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and that has re particularly initially reassured a lot of the sort of pan-Ethiopian, non-Ethiopia folks that ah he, he gets it he can't be in romo it can't be opdo it has to be ethiopia uh, first um and and uh, but on the other hand an awful lot of people in tigray in the amhara region in the south say oh he's in a romo and we know what that means uh, uh and he has to be uh in some ways responsive uh to uh, to, to oromia um the, 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 the question, in, in the midst of this transition from an authoritarian system to where we are now, the, the state as a source of security, the state as a source of uh, stability, the state where security forces did what the state told it to do has been, has retracted. Uh, and so there's an awful lot of security services now who aren't uh, 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 operating on behalf of the state it's not quite the right way to put it, but they're much weaker. It's harder for the state to, to the control less things. They're less assertive. There's the people from Addis, you know, if, if uh, Abi wanted to go to certain places, his security people would say, you don't want to go down there. Right. Uh, where that never, Melis went wherever the heck he wanted to go, whenever he wanted to go. Uh, and so in that way, it's different. There's also more non-state actors, some of whom maybe have weapons, maybe don't, maybe they're bandits, maybe they're criminals, maybe they're people who are score settling. So there's an awful lot of violence. There's some three million people displaced, maybe slightly down now, but at its, at its worst. Three million people disp displaced in Ethiopia, which even for a country of 110 million people is a lot of people. Yeah. Um, 
And so the, the, this transition has led to a, a, a breakdown in security, which if you studied the Soviet Union or Yugoslavia or lots of other places, not too big of a surprise that that would happen in this type of a transition. And you also have a process of ethnic outbidding. So when you have these ethnically defined states in a moment of uncertainty, the parties have gone back to their to, to first principles, which is to claim that you're a better Amhara than the other guy, or to claim that you're a better uh, Sadama than the other guy. And not only within their respective parties, let me give you the Amhara wing of the ruling party story, they're now facing a, a group called NAMA, which is National Association, National Movement of Amhara, I think, uh, which is articulating even a more uh, a categorical story of Amhara nationalism, about how they've been victims of the Tigray, uh, you know, they deserve reparations from the TPLF, there's been an Amhara genocide, they, would, they, they tell you. Uh, and so a really uh, tough uh, nationalist logic in a way that makes it, the, for the Amhara wing of the party, harder to, we, to find that space, and it's gonna be very challenging to the incumbents, this powerful party that doesn't mm -hmm. change, I say, mm -hmm. but it's gonna be hard for them to deal with that problem. Within the Oromo region, the OLF, long in exile, has returned, mm -hmm. uh, maybe uh, unevenly demobilized, or at least there's allegations that violence in certain parts of Oromia are in fact the Oromo Liberation Front. It's, without doing the field work out there, it's very hard to know. Uh, Youth gangs, uh, mobilized youth in a place like Sadama in Hawassa, mm -hmm. young Sadama guys who are uh, attacking non-Sadamas in Hawassa as a way to make claims. The, the way Ethiopia is structured is that, you know, who owns this? Well, whoever controls that and, and makes it their ethnic uh, majority, controls the city, controls the resources, controls the members of parliament who come from that area. And so there's a lot of kind of zero-sum struggles that, no, this should be Somali, not Oromo, or this should be Beni Shangu Gumuz, not Oromo, or that part of Tigray is actually should be part of the Amhara, particularly around cities, Addis Ababa, the many Amhara many Oromo will say that it should be called Finfine, and it's, 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 it's an Oromo city. Yeah. Awful lot of Addis Abans don't say that at all. They see it as a multi-ethnic yeah. city, cosmopolitan, cosmopolitan, it's the national capital, uh, and so on. And those are really tough fights that, right. that are on the, you know, that, that are actively being engaged in in different ways. So let me press you a little bit on this continuity point, because when we talk about uh, Nama or the Sudama movements that have been there or indeed the other parties that are coming along. I mean, part of what has been argued and what you said for the past 25 years and prior to the, the more recent political um, turmoil is these parties playing by the rules of the game, right? That if you had, to, if you wanted to compete, you had to, you had to also use the same appeals to ethnic federalism and so on. And and uh, other parties outside the EPRDF were either unable to do that or chose not to, um, for for various reasons. And now you have these parties, these new movements uh, or newish or let's say reinvigorated movements mm -hmm. that are still playing by those same rules of the game right. in terms of ethnic federalism. So there's continuity in that sense that they, they aren't, there are also of course uh, pan-Ethiopian movements that are re either re-emerging or, or, or coming out of, um, who, who reject the, the model entirely. So you have this element of change potentially where there is that, that call amongst some for uh, something that isn't grounded in ethnicity. You've got, as you pointed out from your examples, those that are calling for it or, or saying, as you said, you know, I'm a better Amhara, I'm a better um, Oromo, whatever it might be. Um, is that then just a continuation of that existing system? Does that mean that it's going to endure? I mean, or, or is it possible or is it I even conceivable that you know, part of the reason why people like Abi Ahmed but not only him, um, outside the EPRDF as well, have have made this broader call to this Ethiopian identity. And you know, you pointed out earlier, urbanization has something to do with this as well. Um, perhaps um, the diaspora has something to do with this in terms of its involvement in in politics. But does it mean that you know we have this strong party system aligned along ethnic regions? Does that logic, which would have been so obvious? 
10 years ago or 15 years ago? Is it as obvious today? No, it's not as obvious today. And, and, the, and the EPRDF of today is not the EPRDF of 2015. Yeah. I mean, it, it has, uh, it's been challenged and it's been changed in important ways. The continuity is that structurally and in terms of this enduring contradiction, yeah. I think there's continuity. I also think this is, a, in the, the, this, uh, is Abi a pan-Ethiopian or is there still an ethnic logic uh, point? Uh, I think that this is a moment of hyper-identity politics in Ethiopia and that th therefore, well, if we're going to have an election in 2020, it's likely to be a hyper-ethnic election. And I don't think, it, it, my guess, I mean, I'm just, I, I don't predict the future particularly well, um, but that I in that context, the EPRDF is best situated mm. to do well. Now, it's going to have trouble with Nama in the Amhara region. The OLF has claims to the uh, Oromo nationalism that are, you know, very old and, and well respected. But then they have to face, you know, the, uh, so far as I can tell, the OLF does not have the political machine on the ground that the Oromo wing of the ruling party has. And so, you know, Wurda to Wurda, Kibeli to Kibeli, there's, you know, Oromo uh, ruling party guys, and the OLF isn't organized that way. It just came back from Eritrea. It, it has some kind of a military capacity, but not a mass mobilizing yeah. capacity. And it's, I, I think I uh, alluded to this before, is that it, it, my, my starting point is that strong parties win elections mm -hmm. and that the EPRDF is orders of magnitude stronger than any other party in Ethiopia and any likely coalition of parties in Ethiopia. Because Nama is not going to make an alliance with the OLF, or at least it would be a very difficult alliance, because one is so ultra Amhara and wants to, doesn't see the Oromo as a reasonable category yeah. of, of mobilization, for example. Um, and so a pan-Ethiopian alliance that can get the, what, what's half of 548, you know, that can get 270-some seats yeah. seems unlikely to me. Now, could they get 40% of the seats? Oh, I think that's, yeah. you know, that, that, that's, that's possible. Um, but, so that's, that's my argument. Somebody was making, I'll give you a different argument that somebody made to me the other day, and they looked back to 2005 and said, well, as you know uh, from 2005 is that, Parties can come in very suddenly and do quite well. Uh, people are surprised. There's an emotional aspect to politics. Uh, there's an identity dimension of politics. And it could be that these non-EPRDF parties you know, do extremely well in this election. And I said, well, I think that my explanation is probably going to be is a 60% ch chance of coming true, and yours is maybe a 40% chance of coming through. You know, so it's not impossible. I mean, but what you, so therefore, the question is, well, what would you look for? And what I would look for is what comes out of the Sadama referendum. Mm -hmm. If that leads to a complete hyper, hyper nationalist you know, uh, process, let's leave it at that, in the south, watch to see what happens to Nama in the Amhara region. If it really becomes able, because Nama is more organized in the countryside than the OLF. There's lots of Nama in, in smallish uh, towns in the Amhara uh, region to see how they will be able to, will they be able to gather votes as right. well? Because uh, the more I saw of that, the more I'd say, oops, I must be wrong, and I will add another chapter to the second edition of the book. Um, because I don't know, you know, who yeah. knows, who knows? And when we talk about Sudama, the referendum, that's November, but there's also, of course, the a possible second referendum in the, the southern region as well. So, you know, and, and who knows where, where that, uh, well, that will go as well, but I suppose we have these uh, barometers of referenda to, to, uh, to observe um, as they keep coming. I mean, you, one more point on the EPRDF. You, you are somewhat dismissive, I think, of the possibility that one of the four members of the coalition could stand alone. Um, I don't know if you... I, can't recall if you consider the possibility that it's uh, more than one that leaves. As you already pointed out, the EPRDF is a is a different kind of thing. While at the same time, you know, as you also say, the the structural power has perhaps shifted from the TPLF to the to the ODP um, member of the of the of the party, the the new name for the for the ODPO. But um, is it possible to have? I mean, notwithstanding what you said and points well taken about any other political challenges not being as well organized, not having as much uh, ability to mobilize and so on. What if you have some kind of fracturing of the EPRDF, whether it's one or more members? Is that something which 
can be positive for political pluralism in Ethiopia, or is it is it something which actually then likely leaves whichever member that might be that defects from the coalition outside of the strong tent of uh, of the strong political party? It, it's a it's another sort of uh, fundamental question, and that I've struggled to try to try to figure out the language and the rhetoric between the different parts, the different constituent parties in the EPRDF is extraordinary. The, what they say about each other and, and how they uh, accuse each other of all kinds of horrible, of horrible deeds, yet they've not left yet. And, and the way that I try to think through it in terms of what the logic would be is that so if the TPLF finally gets so fed up that it leaves, then it says, okay, we're gonna go to Michele and all of those office buildings and banks and insurance companies and hotels we own in Addis, we'll let the Amhara and the Oromo watch over that for us. <laughs> Maybe, uh, you know, our fight at the table to get a share of, of, of the federal funds to come to Tigray, we don't need to be in those discussions. It's better for us to be here angry uh, in, in Michele. I, 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 it could happen that way, but that, that would surprise me. Yeah. Um, but, you know, parties miscalculate, uh, they get escalation spirals and end up in, in places that they didn't mean to. Um, uh, there are people, such as this uh, general supposedly in the Amhara region, who think blowing it up and right. assassinating the regional president is the way to unleash the kind of purifying fire of chaos that will allow some better a day to emerge. That might not be inaccurate, uh, it sounds like... Uh, uh, yeah. It's rather apocalyptic. Yeah. Well, it does. It sounds more like John Brown, perhaps. But, you know, this idea that it's through these kinds of yeah. acts that you get the justice that you need. Right. Possible. Right. Absolutely possible. But there's also some really smart guys in all of these parties. And there's really, these guys have been at it for a long time. So I see it as four parties who don't like each other at all, but will be weaker if they leave the party than if they stay in the party. If you, if you see one of the parties leave, you'll say, Lyons, you need to update your book. But that's the logic that I, that, that I see in this. I'll say one other word on that, because it, it comes up all the time. As the EPRDF for a long, long time has talked about transforming from being a coalition to being a party where individual members enter. Right now, you join the Oromo wing, which is then part of the coalition. You join the Amhara wing, which is then part of the coalition. It would turn itself into a party that you would join directly. You'd be a member of the EPRDF. Uh, we'd get rid of all these, uh, these uh, ethnically based parties. If you were a Somali, or if you were a Berta, or you are far, you could join the party then. They can't, they're not in. All these people in the peripheral regions are not part of the EPRDF uh, coalition. There's a lot to be said for that. It would take care of the urbanization problem. It would take care of the problem of people being mobile. And I think they might do that. I don't think they do that between now and the 2020 election. Mm -hmm. I think, it, I think it's, it, it's too big of a bite. Mm -hmm. Some very smart person told me a couple of months ago that you get the right 20 people in the room and you cut the deal. It's not that hard. Uh, if I saw that, we're in a different, we're in a different, uh, a different logic. Um, and how would that logic sit upon ethnically defined regions? So you'd have EPRDF, a multinational EPRDF governing in, in a Romo state. Mm. There you again would have to work through a calculation. So maybe you need to change the constitution. Well, and the map. And the map, and go back to 1990, you know, or whatever it is. Very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. I would. There's very smart people in Ethiopia. Ethiopia is a land of a thousand seminars right now. <laughs> people trying to think through the political implications of this or that, or how will we get democracy, or how will we get a market economy, or how can we preserve revolutionary democracy, and so on. And very smart people trying to figure out how you can Ethiopia can move from what it is now into something that has kind of a different constitutional order, a different political party uh, structure. The reaction I hear to a lot of that from my Oromo friends is, is great. We finally get in the front seat and you're going to change the rules of the game. Thank you. you know, for all these you know, millennia or these centuries we've been marginalized, we finally move into the front seat and now you say the rules are all wrong and we want to do it some other way. So you're going to have a lot of pushback from a lot of people who see this you know, the last couple of years in positive terms. Does that get managed somehow? Or there is there a way to, you know, it's, it's a political bargain, a new kind of pact, possibly, but it would be, it'll be hard, and I don't think it'll be done in the short run. Okay. Well, thank you so much for a fascinating, compelling uh, book and narrative. <laughs> Not quite done yet, because we're gonna take some questions uh, from the audience, but I, I mean, it's a, I think part of what the value of 
your work here is just to show how these threads, I mean, obviously you're a historian, so you do have uh, that, uh, you don't need to be convinced of the importance of history, but I think for many of us who may not be as familiar with the history or may not see, even if we understand uh, that it's important, how it's significant and how it plays through uh, today in terms of uh, the expressions of these legacies, both in terms of the uh, war to peace transition, but also in terms of how the party came to be and continues to be. So um, just to add to your unanswered questions, uh, let's hope that we can answer some more of them. Um, we have microphones on the left and the right. Uh, just raise your hand. Uh, please tell us who you are and please ask a question. Hi, Zach. Is that working? Yeah. Zach Verdon from Brookings. Uh, congrats, Terrence, on the new book. It's great, great to hear about it. Um, two questions. One is related to the continuity and change discussion you've been having. I asked you this in April, I think, but I wonder if your opinion has changed. Given that need to straddle continuity and change, how does Abi present himself in this election? What is the narrative uh, to sort of straddle that? You, you've started on that conversation already. But secondly, um, with regard to U.S.-Ethiopian relations or relations with the West more broadly, um, it seemed particularly interesting that a pretty significant chunk of the U.S. foreign policy establishment had ties to the old guard and ties to the old guard for a very long time. Uh, and thus, a lot of the narratives, uh, I think, coming out of Ethiopia in the first year post Abiy, uh, very often uh, reflected that view, right? Reflected the view of the guys that were now out of power and, and were remarkably ill-informed about what was actually going on. And I wonder if you just comment, if you've experienced that or your comment on the kind of changing of external facing narratives. Okay. Thank Thanks, Zach. Uh, we'll take uh, two more if there are. Uh, yes, gentleman there. Uh, thank you. Uh, APRDF is a, uh, a beautifully resourced uh, party financially, not just with the endowments, but also because of its enormous membership. Uh, if they're pay paying uh, dues of a dollar, a year, they've got $8 million right away. Actually, they're paying dues much more than that. Uh, how will that play out in the 2020 election, uh, the impact of money and who has it and who doesn't, how that will play out? Who controls the allocation of those resources? Is it at the regional party level? Is it at the executive committee of the overall EPRDF? And would you expect uh, that Ethiopia's neighbors uh, will also have some money uh, in this election, or certainly they will have uh, some horses that they want to bet on. Uh, so just curious about uh, external uh, interest in the upcoming election. All right, thank you. Um, anyone on this side of the room wants to ask a question? Not that that's a short list of questions, but just in case there is someone else there. Okay, the lady there, please. Hi, uh, my name is Dunia Tegin. I'm here representing Amnesty USA. Uh, my question relates to how your reflection on the human rights condition in Ethiopia uh, throughout you know, this transition from 1991 to, the, to today. Uh, how did you see the ruling party did and what can be done better in Ethiopia? Thank you very much. Thanks very much. So maybe we can start with uh, Zach's first question here about how Abi presents himself in the 2020 elections. I mean, to date, Abi has framed himself as a reformer, as somebody who can bring, uh, uh, you know, can do the things that the EPRDF had stopped doing in, the, in, in, in 2018. He plays more, his rhetoric is more towards the, uh, Ethiopia unity side than it is to the Oromo side, but you know, he needs to win his seat. And he, the ODP, the Oromo wing of the ruling party has renamed itself, it's now the ODP. Mm. Uh, the ODP needs to, you know, carry seats. And that's, what the, that's what the party does. It's in their DNA to win, right? That's, that's what parties do, they compete for power. Um, and he's a member of the party. I mean, I think to see him as a party stalwart rather than as an anti-EPRDF force is important. Um, uh, 
I, I think what Abby's been doing, and I've, I've never met Abby, so I don't have any great insights into his, you know, his, his inner, inner thoughts, but that he has, uh, he, he acts as if for his reform to continue, he can't be distracted by all these little brush fires all across the country. There's a conflict here one week, there's a conflict here the other week, uh, and so on. That if he, if he goes that way, he's, his focus is in a hundred places and uh, he doesn't, he can't keep going forward and that he's just gonna try to keep going forward, kind of keep his head down. Uh, I think there's, a, there's some wisdom in that. I'm not sure three million displaced allows you to do that. I mean, I think that you do need to deal with 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 some of these issues, I, uh, but I, I, so I don't know how he positions himself or how what his narrative is. If there's still a huge amount of violence in Ethiopia coming into a May 2020 election, and furthermore, how does he build the stability? If he could, he would. Um, and it's extremely extremely difficult. But uh, I mean, that's a kind of a fractured or not very uh, satisfactory answer to that. In terms of the international community's relationship uh, with Ethiopia, I think a lot of people breathed a huge sigh of relief in between January 2018 and April 2018, when it looked like in January, this thing is going off the cliff. Maybe it's already too late to turn it around to when uh, Abby came in, has this sort of charismatic uh, uh, love fest, Abby mania breaks out, you know, people compare him to, uh, well, Various people, not, not all of them uh, from this world, <laughs> some from the spiritual world. <laughs> In other words, some people say he must be the elect of God, not to be too, uh, too, uh, too obscure. Um, uh, my, now, there are, you are indeed correct that there's a lot of people who had deep relationships with the old order. Uh, there's no doubt about that. But what I would say, and it's kind of in, in, in the opposite direction of that, is what worries me about U.S. policy, in particular towards Ethiopia, is how personalized it gets, how quickly. That it's the U.S. wants to support Abiy, which I think is a very dangerous way to frame any relationship, rather than the Ethiopian people wish to work with, the U.S. people wish to work with the Ethiopian people to bring uh, you know, democracy and development. I, I think that's a big problem, and the U.S. government also has a tendency to equate access with influence. Well, I can get in to see Abby whenever I want to, so I'm influential in this town. Uh, that happened with uh, Melis as well. Uh, I could get to see him, and so therefore I'm doing it right when, uh, I think that's deeply, deeply problematic. But the, the donors, I, I know this from the election sphere about preparing for 2020 elections, that the donors are all in to support the elections. They're bringing in lots and lots of money, the Europeans, the Americans, to the UNDP, to various uh, US-based uh, groups like NDI, IRI, IFAS, and so on. Um, because the plan B is not, is a big is a big worry. Uh, it, let me switch to the to the second question from my, my friend Jerry Jones, who I think might have started that thirty year conversation with Jerry many 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 years ago, and some of it actually at USIP in the old days where it used to be by Dupont Circle. Um, the EPRDF is a very wealthy party, uh, and that again is part of the continuity. They ain't giving up that money. Uh, it's still there. Nobody else has money like that. Although Nama is not poor. Uh, Nama's getting resources. I don't have any idea why, but they have offices and uh, people who are staffing those offices in the countryside of the Amhara region. Um, the, the membership dues, I believe, stay in the four regional parties. What is also organized in the four regional parties are the endowment funds. Each of the four parties has an endowment fund, but the Tigray endowment fund effort is orders of magnitude bigger. It's been around longer. It's had the advantages of being uh, having the opportunity to make some very good investments, uh, often linked to the need to have government support for trade and access to credit and things like that. Uh, and so in that way, the re while the party is wealthy, it's not evenly wealthy. Uh, so that might play out in, in 2020. Figuring out the neighbors is, is difficult. I mean, you always hear from certain circles in Ethiopia that the Eritreans are behind one thing or another. Uh, and you might, and you can, and that, that, you know, the Eritreans will be doing something to uh, support one side or another in the coming elections. Uh, 
they might, but I'm not sure how much oomph they have. I mean, how many to, what, what the resource base or ability to shape these things uh, actually is. Uh, of larger concern would probably be Gulf money. There's a lot of money from the Gulf. You've been involved in some of these other projects here at USIP. Awful lot of Gulf money going to all across the Horn for all kinds of different re uh, reasons. Uh, and would, you know, if UAE, well, if what we saw in Somalia where the UAE and the gutter uh, division ended up with funding different political uh, tendencies or streams. If that were to play out in Ethiopia, it would be extremely problematic. I, I don't see evidence of that. I think if the money has come in, it's to support the state. Uh, if it was perceived as Muslims coming in to shape Ethiopia's political future, that would be a very big deal. Uh, the Orthodox Christians see themselves under siege, and there's, they can point to things on why they feel that way. Uh, and so that would be a, uh, a, a concern. Uh, on the human rights conditions, Ethiopia had a really, uh, really very uh, bad uh, record on human rights uh, up until recently. They, they, a lot of political prisoners, a lot of people were arrested. Uh, the Abbey himself talks about torture in the prisons, uh, how they mistreated uh, so many people uh, for so many years. Uh, and so I think there's been a sea change on that. The political prisoners have been released. They're trying to reinvigorate the human rights. Is it the council or commission? The commission with uh, Daniel Bekele, who's a very reputable guy, uh, under-resourced, and so on and so forth, has a huge, a huge, uh, a huge lift. But I think they are uh, trying that. Ethiopia remains the Ethiopian justice sector very under-resourced. The prisons are terrible, uh, and and so on. So there's a long, long way to go. But that's not a continuity story. That's a change story in what has happened in the last in the last two years. Now. Uh, but it may, it, may, it may darken that very sunny moment for a second. After, in the aftermath of the assassination in, uh, of the president of the Amhara region in, uh, in Bahridar in June, was it? Uh, the government used the anti-terrorism proclamation to arrest people, bad old, bad old days. They declared a, basically a state of emergency, the bad old days. They turned off the internet and they arrested uh, like 1,200 people overnight. So the state still has that capacity. It has not lost coercive capacity when it feels that it can, I suppose, but must, uh, must use it. And th so that is to say that this change of Ethiopia, particularly on the question of human rights, the pendulum is decidedly in a different place. But if you take my pendulum analogy, pendulums can swing back. And there's reasons to be continually vigilant and to keep your eye on it and to call them out if you see early signs of, of things like why do you turn off the internet? And what happened in the Somali region last year might be another example of that, Indeed. right? So let's take another round of questions. I think Eric had his hand up uh, just here. Eric Robinson. Eric Robinson, National Endowment for Democracy. Um, you said that the struggle started in some very remote areas on the periphery and now I'm also hearing people say that, some very connected people, that it's about elite consensus. We need to have elite consensus if anything's gonna go forward. How do you square that with um, the power of social media, the age of the population, the people who cracked open the space? Is this elite consensus conversation about falling back in the same old patterns of uh, the people at the top controlling things and how is that gonna fit, sit with uh, the youth movements? Thank you. Uh, I see the gentleman here. Yes. Uh, Phil Schrafer, retired international healthcare consultant. China, could you comment on China's role politically and economically in terms of quality and production that they've achieved? Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Uh, yes, here. I'm Hank Cohen. Uh, I have a question about the TPLF and the economics. I believe at the beginning, uh, TPLF companies were created, you know, trucking, uh, fertilizer, and that sort of thing, and they, they were getting government contracts. It, does that system still exist? Okay, thanks. And uh, was there anyone else over here? Did I see a hand? Um, yes.
my name is Johannes uh, from the Eritrean community. How do you see the relationship of Eritrea and Ethiopia in the future? Thank you. So we have Eritrea and China and the TPLF. Where do you want to start? Uh, I, I'll try to do them uh, in order, uh, and that's like four more books, but let me, let me try to, to, to say something about it. Uh, uh, Eric's point about do you need elite consensus or do you have to and you have to see this transition as initiated by, you know, kind of rank and file, young kids in the streets of various Oromo cities, uh, uh, and that there needs to be some way to capture that energy. I, I think you need both. I, my expectation would be that the elite are likely to do better than the kids on the street in this transition, just because... Uh, Unfortunately, that's what often, often happens. Control of, so the, then, then the next question is, well, what happens to the angry kids uh, in the street? I mean, if you could get, you know, 25 million good jobs in Ethiopia, a lot of these problems would take care of themselves, but you can't. It's very, very hard. It's very, very slow. And the frustrations are, uh, as we saw in 2016, are very close to the surface. Um, the, uh, the, the, and there needs to be at least a, a, a narrative, let me put it that way, where uh, young folks who got their degree and now can't find a job and so on can imagine themselves in an Ethiopia where they would have a place, a place where they could be uh, you know, respected and have economic uh, uh, security and you know, be able to get married and start a family and all of these things that now they're kind of hanging out trying to figure out how do I do this. Uh, and an elite consensus by itself isn't going to solve that problem. The, the 2016 uh, uh, demonstrations, in my view, came out of a very particular political economy of joblessness and lack of hope about the future uh, that, has not been, that has not changed. That remains the same. There was a lot of kind of giddy optimism at the beginning of Abiy because it was such a fresh, fresh approach, but that's worn out. Um, and uh, well, at least it's, it's, it's fading. And so the, 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 the possibility that there'd be instability again is, is, very, is very real. China and Ethiopia, China is everywhere in Africa. Uh, in Ethiopia in particular ways, particularly in some of the infrastructure investments, the roads, the railroad, the urban railroad, uh, airports. I mean, they've done, a, they've done a lot of the big construction is, the big office buildings is Chinese construction. There were those who follow uh, macroeconomics more closely than I who were worried about the debt burden of Ethiopia, that they've borrowed too much and it's not clear where the, the rise of productivity is going to come to pay back uh, these debts. Um, so, I mean, China is a, is a, is a very big player, uh, but it's a largely economic player. It's come in and offered its uh, services, particularly for construction and its capital for investments, and has been welcomed. Uh, on the TPLF contracts, uh, you were correct in how uh, the initial endowment funds effort, but also other, the Red Sea Trading Company, other things that the TPLF had created during the time of the armed struggle, then moved into this relationship with the ruling party in ways that they had access to resources and markets that, that uh, competitors uh, could not gain. I don't know if since uh, the, uh, you know, Abbey has come to power if those contracts have been broken. Uh, as you know that some of them, uh, particularly Metech, uh, has been under investigation and a lot of people arrested and, and charges of corruption. Some of the other party affiliated businesses have similarly been been accused, I'll say, uh, of corruption. I just don't know if that, what, what the extent to that is. But that's another part, well, another way of this, this, uh, this narrative. A lot of non-Tigrayans say, but you haven't brought them all in yet. There's still all these corrupt people who stole our money, and why aren't you doing more to do it? Where the TPLF says, this is targeting. They're targeting the TPLF, what they call corruption, anti-corruption campaigns, is just a TPLF campaign. And so it gets very contentious. And as the way Ethiopia is structured, very quickly, ethnicized and political because it's hard to separate that. It's, not, it's hard to say, I have a problem with the TPLF but not with the Tigray people because the way the thing is formed, it's so, it, it's so close. 
Eritrea, Ethiopia. Again, I was surprised <laughs> in my predictive uh, abilities to have expected a uh, normalization of relations between Ethiopia and Eritrea as, as, uh, as uh, the Prime Minister uh, uh, Abiy built a bridge of love, as he called it, to connect, with uh, to connect with Eritrea in a very, very dramatic way, in a very emotional way. A lot of people could go back and see their families. The border was open for a time. And that was all you know, encouraging. That was all, uh, you know, looking, looking hopeful. More recently, the, the, the implement, the, the nuts and bolts of how are you going to establish trade relations, what's going to be the currency exchange, who's going to give visas to whom, and, and so on and so on, seemingly have stalled the process, which isn't too surprising, but it, it's also worrying that if it gets locked in this pattern of using kind of technical uh, problems, as we know from 1998, those technical problems are often, uh, can be used, well, can be triggers or used as triggers for larger escalations. I mean, the Ethiopia-Eritrea divide uh, since 1998 has been enormously damaging to both countries. The amount of, you know, a generation of development lost as both sides, Eritrea in particularly, have spent uh, inordinate percentages of their national wealth on, on military defense uh, uh, and so forth. And so if that relationship can get uh, even incrementally better, then that would be very good for both countries, I believe. Well, thank you, Terence Lyons, for uh, coming to talk to us about your uh, book and uh, for reflecting on both the, the past and the present and ruminating a little bit on the future <laughs> of where uh, Ethiopia may be headed. Uh, please join me in thanking uh, Dr. Terence Lyons. Uh, the thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. Good job.